This is the question and answer session for week two. And you have Marlon Cobos, Jorge Soberon, and me. Um, we are working towards making this a live event, but it's not yet. Um, remember, everybody, that between Monday and Wednesday, you should post your questions. And remember, everybody, that when you post your questions, please do not post the question of how many points do I need to fit a niche model? At least one person did ask that again this, um, this week. Okay, I'm going to put up the um, set of questions that were turned in. They start at line 270, and they go down to line 547. And so I, um, I've i highlighted a few, and I suspect Jorge and uh, Marlon may have noticed a few. Um, but we should jump in. You guys have some, or you want me to? Super easy, man. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to take on one that I saw several times, line 490 and elsewhere. But in video number one, why do you mention ecological niche model and species distribution model as synonyms? Aren't they supposed to be different? So um, I think there are several things going on here. One is that we are a group of instructors who have... Uh, different backgrounds and different opinions and different thoughts about these different things. Um, and so video number one was from, from Richard Pearson. Um, and um, Richard has his point of view on these questions. And the week before, you heard a different set of points of view on these questions. Um, but I, I think that there's a point to be made, which is that in the literature... In the great bulk of the literature, um, niche model and distribution model are indeed treated as if they were synonymous. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that one or or several may have different interpretations or different opinions about this, but Richard is certainly correct that in the literature you will see distribution model used to refer to something that at least I would call a niche model or a niche model used to refer to something that might best be referred to as a distribution model. So in one sense, yes, they are syn synonymous. In common use, they are quite synonymous. Opinions, guys? Well, sometimes niche ecological niche models like they are the word or the name is not used like that because people uh, usually think niche as the function of a species in, a, in an environment or in an habitat uh, which is a different definition of the, of this word and then I think I think sometimes it's, that's also uh, like one of the reasons why people use more species distribution models rather than ecological niche models because there's different types of niches and because people is more used to some of those concepts than others. And uh, other people in their questions ask whether species distribution models are just the projection in geographical space of the niche model. Uh, to a certain degree, that is the case, and the reason why people call it SDMs when they are niche models is because on the way to get the distribution, which is a map, you first do the niche models. Uh, when you project the niche in geography, what you get is a map of the areas where the species would be comfortable, the suitability areas not necessarily the distribution. 
there may be suitable areas, for instance, for a neotropical species across the Atlantic in, in, in Africa, perfectly suitable areas. The, the example I use all the time is tigers, Siberian tigers, which occur in ecosystems which are practically the same as uh, in, in the New World, like in Alaska or parts of Canada, and they, tigers don't occur there. So what you do when you project a niche model is to, in geography, is in general, what you get is some sort of potential area of distribution or regions of suitable environments, not necessarily an area of distribution because the areas of distribution require extra mechanisms. You need to, to include the movements, you need to include habitat uh, requirements, you need to include, um, which are different from climatic requirements, and you need to include interactions. So that's that's why projecting ENMs into geography is not exactly getting an area of distribution, it's getting a potential area of distribution. And this is a subtle but very real uh, difference. I think I'll, I'll amplify that, but maybe I'd remove the word subtle, which is to say, if I had a perfect model of the fundamental niche of a species, and I asked where on geography is that model, are those conditions met? That is the area A in the BAM diagram, okay? That means that if you look at the BAM diagram, whatever the effects of B and M are, are not included in modifying that area A. So I'm, I don't know that it's subtle. Um, I guess if it's over a small extent, then it's just the question of what are the effects of B, of biotic interactions. If it's over a large extent, like the whole world or the whole universe, then the difference between A and the three-way intersection of A, B, and M should be very big. The, the, dis the difference should be very big. And actually that answers another question. That A in the band diagram, that does mean the fundamental nature of the species. I mean, those are the, the entire set of environments that the species can live on. Well, that is... A in the BAM diagram is the geographic manifestation yes. Yes. of the fundamental niche. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful to talk about what space are yeah. we discussing. The, the BAM is, is a geographic uh, scheme. Okay, here's a question for you, mainly for Jorge, I think. We're going to do a few more of these week one questions, and then we're going to kind of push you guys to look at week two. Um, but thinking about a possible relation between the BAM diagram and the three different types of niche we have seen so far, the fundamental, the existing, and the realized, could we say that the fundamental niche is based on or more direct, directly related with the abiotic variables, A, the realized niche is more based on the biotic variables B, and the existing niche is more related with the accessibility M, or is this a misconception? Who wants to answer that? I can. You go first. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there is a bit of a misconception there. The A area is those regions in the world, in geography, where you can find the conditions defined by the fundamental niche. You can um, sort of reduce that a little bit by adding interactions. And you can reduce that even further by adding limitations for movements. So in the end, you, you finish with the intersection of the three circles. And the intersection, the environments in the intersection of the three circles is the realized niche. It's slightly redefined from Hutchinson, 
but it's pretty consistent with what he said, uh, and uh, we think that that is um, a very useful distinction. So, in the intersection of the three, you, if you sample those localities in the intersection of the three circles, you will get samples of the of the realized niche. And if you sample only in the A circle, you will get samples of the existing niche. The fundamental, as we often say, it's a more difficult thing to, to measure because basically you need to do experiments. Although we are getting slightly more and more um, evidence that when you do uh, an ecological niche model in the right way, probably you are not far from estimating the, the existing niche and therefore the fundamental to, in, from certain perspective. But these are still open questions. In regards to the specifics of the, of the question that I was asked, the A circle corresponds to the existing niche and the intersection of the three circles correspond to the realized niche and the B circle, I, I, I don't know what it corresponds to, I don't know. It's well, the, let's clarify. The fundamental niche mapped onto geography gives us A. Exactly. But A mapped onto environmental space gives us the existing niche. Yes. No these are not two two-headed arrows that take us exactly. between these two spaces. Very much so. And the reason why is because in the current world, or in the war, or in the scenario in which you're working on, not all the environments that are inside the fundamental niche are manifested. That's the reason why you cannot transfer the other way around. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a very good question. Here's line 376. What does it mean, model transferability? So this is a question about, I assume, Geng Ping Zhu's uh, presentation on invasive species where essentially you are transferring the model. Well, what does that mean? It is we're going to calibrate our model across some area that we have meaningful and thorough sampling of the presence of our species. We're going to talk a lot about this once we get out of the application section of this course. But essentially, we have to pick an area where presences can occur, which is to say the species has had access to that area such that if the species is there, we can assume that the environments are suitable. And if the species is not there, we can assume that the species has had access to that place and for some reason didn't like it or didn't persist there. Okay, that's the definition of this M area. But then we have to refine M to the area that's been sampled. And so that may, re that may reduce it still more. Regardless, we have that calibration area, which is accessible to the species and which is sampled and therefore has data for us in, in, um, as scientists. But we may be interested in the species distributional potential across some other area. So Geng Ping's talk was about what if we calibrate maybe on one continent and we ask what would be the distributional potential of this species on this other continent. Or actually with the presentation I gave you, which was on discovering species and populations, we may be asking, given what we know about this species, where else might it have populations or where might there be a related species? And so in both of those cases, what we're talking about is using the niche model that we calibrated on one landscape 
and using it to classify another landscape about suitability. Okay, it also could be for climate change projections, which we're going to hear about, I think, next week, um, where you, you say, well, in 2020, I know that the species is here. Where might it be in 2070 or, or, or 2100? That transfer is a delicate step because, as Marlon just commented, any given area on Earth does not have all of the relevant environments represented. And so we may have gaps in our knowledge. We may have truncation of the, the fundamental niche of our species and not be able to observe our species against all of the environments in the transfer area based on what we know in our calibration area. So that's a quick introduction to model transferability. We're going to talk a lot about that in a few weeks. Uh, just to, to a little, well, to stress something, transferring is not the same as extrapolating. Extrapolation means going outside the range of fitting the model, and transferring means applying your model to different spaces or times. Yes. And, and there are... There are two things I would like to add. The first one is that uh, what Tom was saying about truncation, you can think that in the, in the following way. Imagine if you are doing experiments with a species to, to define how the species performs in a thermal gradient. You will have values of low performance and high performance and then they will get lower again. So that you get if you like uh, expose the species to an enough amount of temperatures and that will mean that you don't have truncation in the response you're getting. But if you take the values that the species is using from a set of rasters and the values that are in the background and create a correlational model, uh, you'll get sometimes responses that are continually increasing and they never get down. And that means truncation, because you don't know till what point the suitability or the response you're getting is going to continue getting up, and then when it's going to come down. And that's the first point. And then the, the other one is also related to another question here about niche conservatism. All the transferability that you just hear about is related to that concept. Like the only reason why we can transfer a model, an ecological niche model of species from one time to another or from one area to another is because we're uh, assuming based on evidences that uh, the niche of a species does not change that much in a small periods of time. Or even in, in large periods of time, they do not change that much. That's why you can transfer a model created in a current uh, environment and to a future environment or to a past environment, always with care, care and being careful about like potential evolutionary adaptation changes that can, can exist. Okay, Jorge, here's one for you. Um, what number? 378. Um, this is one that I saw at least four times amongst the questions, so it's worth answering. Um, this person asks, I don't understand the consequence of taking into account the Ali effect on the abundance, the correlation abundance niche centroid distance. Um, to me, Ali effect is a threshold of abundance below which the fitness is negative. Perhaps I'm wrong in this concept. Thank you. Well, that's exactly what it is, and uh, that means that there is a populational, a demographic effect on the area of distribution. Um, if you have an ali effect and your species is spreading across uh, an area where there is low suitability, the ali effect may be the responsible to create an area of zero individuals in the population. It's like a barrier, which is not done, is not uh, um, 
the result of, uh, of a physical environment like a, a river or a sea or a range of mountains, but only low quality of the environment and together with the alley effect, then the, the species won't be able to invade that area. So if there is across that region, there is another suitable area, then the alley effect is going to prevent your species from reaching that suitable area. And therefore, when you do the, the correlation study, you will be correlating areas which are very suitable, therefore in the, with inside the niche model, but unoccupied because the species was prevented from reaching that region. That's why the alley effect acts as a barrier. And barriers uh, are a big complication when you are uh, trying to correlate species abundance with uh, position in niche space. Niche space may be perfectly favorable and your species may not be there because of other reasons which include dispersal problems, interactions and alley effects. Okay. Other questions? Here's a simple one. Four, five, three. It says, why Maxon uses only ellipsoid niche format? And that, well, ah. it, do, it does not. Maxon has a, at least five different response types of these kind of things. So uh, it's not necessarily an ellipsoid envelope uh, approach. So and, and in fact, it say. uses combinations of uh -huh. lots of different response types. So you can generate pretty much any response shape you want. Yeah, from a very simple um, one, like linear, to a very complex one. But Maxim is a machine learning algorithm, so sometimes even if you uh, ask the program to do something, it will get reach a point of complexity and won't do something. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to a question from Jean Ganglo, which is a practical question. But can you can he have access to the publications to which re, we refer during these these talks? And I'll show you on the course page. Um, here's week one, week two, week three coming up. But you see this column I is additional materials, and so when we make reference to papers. Uh, we try to put them here in um, in the additional materials link. So that's there. Um, and if the instructors supply me with with the documents, I can put them in that column. Okay, Jorge, you sounded like you had a question. There. Yes, and it's question four hundred and fifty-seven. Four fifty-seven. Yes. Um, Hold on. Well, there, there are two parts to that question. The first is whether we can include predation and competition. Uh, it is very difficult because those are highly dynamic layers, which are very difficult to model using, um, well, rasters, raster layers. Uh, when you try to include uh, a predator, the predator is probably fluctuating by the, um, in time. And that makes it very difficult to model with just one raster. It is, uh, I mean, you can be ingenious and, and, and do it. For instance, if you have enough data, you can use several time slices and substitute layers. But it's going to be quite a complicated thing. Or if those dynamics are, if the, the spatial variation is much more dramatic than the temporal variation, then you could take an average or create something that is essentially a static biotic variable. Yeah, that, that, the, the main problem is that the, the, most algorithms that we use to do um, niche-based distribution modeling require uh, layers, and layers tend to be static, and some variables are very dynamic, and that's the main problem. I, I will put on the additional materials site a paper, very early paper, but a very highly cited paper about uh, the availability of woodpecker holes as 
um, as a kind of an enabling dimension of the environment, which is biotically mediated, but but which opens nesting potential for other species. And that's fairly static. Uh, you, you, uh, now, the other thing is that you can add competition if you have... Um, uh, if you know that the competitor is really, really strong and always the result of the competition is exclusion of one species, then you can model species A and use that as a layer for modeling species B. But those are cases where you have to have, uh, well, significant um, biotic information and uh, it's not a general thing. You can. And so, that probably underestimates the dynamism of that interaction, right? But that's what I... What I mean, if I have 50,000 of one species and two of the other species, the outcome is different than if it were the other way around or in equal numbers. Yes, although there are certain species that always outcompete sure. the sure. competitor. So sure. in those cases, it is possible. So number two uh, of, of question in line four, five, seven. The, the person asking this question is confused about the idea of measuring niche in fitness units. Well, the idea of niche is that fitness is affected by environmental variables. That's the concept. And the, that concept is very valid and very fruitful. So, uh, in, in, in an ideal world, we would be fitting surfaces of fitness to environmental uh, variables, but we don't have fitness units in most cases, maybe sometimes, but in most cases we don't have fitness. What we have is occupation. So um, what an algorithm like Maxent does is find you uh, regions that are similar to the regions where the species has been occupied. Now, is that related to fitness? Probably yes, but you need extra assumptions and extra considerations. Um, that, that, so that would be my answer. In, 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 in Hutchinson's idea, the niche is a function of fitness from environmental combinations, multivariate space. And ecological niche modeling is removed one step from that because we don't measure fitness directly, we just measure presence. Presence clearly is correlated to fitness, but you need the extra assumptions. And in fact, one type of quality control or filtering that we rarely are able to do is filtering an incidence that has a negative fitness, a sink population, and essentially throwing those out and retaining only the incidences that have positive fitness, which is to say a source population or at least a stable population. And so we almost never are able to do that. So that means that um, our occurrences that should be all within the three-way intersection of A, M, and B sometimes are contaminated by occurrences that could be outside of A, but within M. Which are the same populations. That's right. Okay, other questions? There was one here I wanted to answer, but I don't mm -hmm. remember what that is. That's a problem. Or okay. if you find it, I can... I Someone can... said something about what program or algorithm to use. What, what does it tell you? Which one to choose? And I don't know if you did already that. You know, that's a question that we're going to be much better mm -hmm. able to answer in a few weeks. Okay, and then the other I mean, the, the thing to remember, and I'm saying this mainly for the people who are going to be submitting questions next week, is that right now we are talking about three talks. One was an overview of applications. One was... Um, using niche models to discover species or populations, and one was applications to understanding uh, invasive species. So, um, you know, that's my, my usual reminder of everybody to please um, ask questions about the material of that week. 
I have another one. You have another one. What number? It's four five eight. Four five eight. Okay. First, uh, the question is whether fitness measures um, uh, that were supposed to be correlated with the distance to, to distance to the mid centroid. If that argument applies both to animals and to plants, and the answer is yes. But of course, it's an empirical question. We know that in certain cases, it has been demonstrated that niche distance and, and abundance are related, and sometimes they aren't. And that will work, although I don't recall cases with plants. We have mostly done animals. Um, I don't see any reason why plants shouldn't work as well. That's question one. Number two, uh, it says that for the shape of fundamental niche, only two variables were used, and is it is possible to create the shape with more variables? And of course, it is possible. Uh, only as as the question says, there are very few studies or no studies. However, we are exploring the idea that you can get some approximations to the fundamental niche using ENM, using ecological niche modeling. And maybe there are some circumstances where you, you can, depending on whether you are very much inside, the, 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 the occurrences are very much inside the available environments, and maybe you have some um, uh, experimental data that you can use as a Bayesian prior and things like that. So yes, it is possible to include more than two variables. Um, it, uh, the idea of the fundamental niche is almost an infinite number of variables, which is uh, useless for practical purposes. Uh, what you are getting when you use two or three or one are projections of some ideal shape in a space of infinite number of variables into spaces of much fewer, two, three, maybe four sometimes. Um, that is a theoretical uh, problem, but yes, you can use more than two variables in practice. In theory. In theory and in practice. Well. But some of the tools that we will talk about are limited to just two or just three dimensions. Yeah. They can be practical. improved on. Uh, when, you, when you start adding variables, you get very quickly into what is called the curse of dimensionality. <laughs> and it becomes impractical very, very fast. But in theory, you can add 20. No, there is a question. What number? I think it's kind of related to transferability. Uh -huh. What number? It's 433. It says, could you apply this, the methods of for SDM to infer potential distribution of genera or families? And the answer is, and you can apply the methods. The methods do whatever you tell them. But uh, there is some things to think about. Imagine two species that are sister species, but they are distributed differently. So one of them is in high altitudes and the other one is in low lowlands. From that you can kind of infer that those two species have different preferences, not different preferences in the environmental space. And also, I mean, those distributions may be the result of like other biotic interaction, but they do have different preferences. And then, if you include those two species in just one genera, if your question is about the entire genera, you may get some answer. And the, and the idea of niche conservatism also kind of supports you, your inference from the genera. But when you're combining information that is too different, you may get different answers. For example, if you combine those two species and you calibrate a model, the response can be like, by model, like this, and that is not a niche, and that's not an ecological niche. If you think about that, ecological niche may be very related to like species or populations of those species, and the response you can get from those kind of like biological uh, interactions with the environment. So, 
you need you, you need to think better about doing these kind of things. And I'll, I I have done something like that, but just to infer the niche of a more broadly distributed species. So I'll give a roughly similar answer to the same question, but I think I'd see it much more as a conscious decision that one might take. Obviously, it's all within the assumption of niche conservatism, which is to say if niches are evolving, then you would really want to reduce your niche modeling efforts to not even species, but uh, deems, essentially. Uh, which is to say, if there's a lot of plasticity of niche in an evolutionary sense, then you have to stick with the finest possible definition of a lineage. But the empirical observation has been that um, niches don't change very much or very quickly. And so if that's the case, then we get an in, into an interesting trade-off. If we work at the level of an individual deem or a, an individual species, we can be seeing the ecological niche of that set of populations against a very restricted <coughs> set of environments. We'll talk later about Wallacean species, but Wallacean species are very hard to get good models for. And so one strategy can be to add in related species if the niche is not evolving. Those Adding in those related species essentially increases the size and environmental diversity of our M region, of our our calibration region. Again, we'll talk about that later on as well. And we're essentially then seeing the species that we're interested in against a broader set of environments. Um, and it moves us away from those Wallacean species and towards something that's more tractable in analysis. Here's one that's kind of related, kind of not, line 437. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, hi, dear professors. Hello. Um, talking about application of SDM. How appropriate is it to use an SDM of one species to determine the pro possible distribution of another, considering that both are distributed in the same areas, for example, Andean cloud forest, but maybe the second species has fewer records. Okay, so I'm going to modify several things about this question. If we are doing anything other than inferring the distribution of the initial target of modeling species, then we probably ought to use the niche modeling um, label. But Again, that, that may be just semantics, or it may have a deeper meaning and implications, as, as Jorge mentioned last week. Um, but can we use a model of one species to anticipate the distribution of another? Well, if they're closely related, and if niches are not evolving very quickly or very easily, then obviously yes. The, the, the ecological niche of one species will inform us about the distributional potential of a related species. And in fact, Jorge and I and one other colleague published exactly that result in Science in 1999. And that paper has been cited way too many times. Um, and that was really where we started thinking about this as niche modeling. Now, if simply the two species are co-distributed, I begin to get a lot more uncomfortable. That is, if the two species 
occur in the same places, but um, are not phylogenetically related to one another, then you, yeah, you could use one species to look for the distribution of the other, but under an assumption, which I would find a little bit par paralyzing, um, that these two species happen to have the same niche. And my experience is that even species that are broadly co-distributed, the devil ends up being in the details. And so those little details, you know, one site where this species was found and the, and the other one not, and vice versa, that ends up making for some meaningful differences in the niche models. So I think maybe not. Anything else come to mind, Marlon? No, what about that? No. I think for exploration is valid, like for getting an idea of what, what you need to do for that specific species, which is the focus of your interest, but not to infer anything. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, if I'm interested in a very, very, very rare species of some rare biome, and there are three other species that live in that same biome, then I could explore models for those three other species to see where else that biome is distributed. Remember that case? We, Tom helped me with a study in which I had two sister species, the closest related species in the phylogeny. One lives across the entire island, and the other one lives in a, a two or three places that have the specific type of soil that they need to reproduce. They are morphologically similar. They have almost the same like size and like morphological conditions make you think that those two species may have similar temperature tolerances, like at least for the uh, desiccation like, rates or stuff like that. But uh, in the distribution, they don't look similar at all. At all. And sometimes, uh, just to infer about like temperature tolerances or humidity tolerances of these like very readily, very like uh, narrowly distributed species, you can you can make such an assumption. But it's it's complicated to get like potential distribution maps for that species from the other points, from the points of the other species, because that will give you the entire island when this species is only in those places that have that kind of soil. So those kind of things you have to think before doing exercises like this. We'll put that paper in the package online if you're interested in reading it. Okay. Huh. Well, Anything else? We're coming up on an hour, so... Um, I'll, I'll do one more. You do one more if you want, but here's one more. Can we model a scarce, rare, or endangered species distribution to use it in a work on areas of endemism? That is, in a work where there are many other species distributions not necessarily rare. Sure. You may have to use different techniques to deal with the small sample sizes that go with your rare, endangered, or scarce species. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, for example, Richard Pearson, uh, 2007, Journal of Biogeography, um, presents a test for uh, how to evaluate models where you don't have many data points. Uh, and Antoine Guisson has done some really interesting work with um, creating many small models. In very small? Yeah, very simple models, one, one variable, a few variables, and then putting those together. Um, so yeah, you can. Uh, you'll find that those species that have very little knowledge end up taking a lot more work, but you can. 
one last that, sorry go ahead and that's related to your other question as well somehow because what Dan said is also like a uh, something that you're gonna say uh, see after this because we're gonna talk more about different algorithms and stuff like that. So the the interesting thing about all these studies is that you have to understand your question. This is a good question. It's about modeling niches of uh, rare rare species, and to do so, you have to think in how are those records in the environmental space? How is the background? or the accessible area for that species. Is it possible to apply a correlation type niche modeling approach or you have to do something more like an envelope type model or even uh, similarity test, like uh, similarity approaches have been used to respond to those kinds of questions. So, uh, and that is related to this question that says, is it important if I understand the mathematics or the algorithm? Well, not 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 the whole mathematic behind the the whole math, uh, set of mathematical like formulas and stuff that behind the algorithm, but you do have to understand what the algorithm is doing, what kind of response is calibrating, or how is it characterizing or, or classifying the environments that you are assuming are suitable for the species. It's it's a, it's an important thing to know before like discussing your results because you're going to say this is suitable for the species the species may be there and if you want to do like this areas of endemism thing imagine if you don't know how those are being classified which is to say any tool that you use in science it's important to understand how and why it does what it does. Obviously, when it's you know program code or uh, some package, you can run that code or run that package without um, without the the knowledge of what's going on. But it's a little bit of a dangerous undertaking. Um, it's surprising how many biologists don't really want to be bothered by the details. So they don't want to see, as, as we say, you know, under the hood of the car and see what's making it run. And there are some things that you can do um, with that kind of black box approach. But I think it's good to have at least some understanding of why things happen come out of that algorithm or that that package the way they come out. Last question? Done? Okay, well, everybody say goodbye to Jorge. He got a phone call. Say goodbye to Marlon. Say goodbye to me. Um, remember, questions Monday to Wednesday. Remember, don't ask, how many points do I need to fit a niche model? Um, we'll have a next set of videos online for you Monday morning. Thanks for tuning in. Take care, everybody.